Um, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 6 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. And uh, Matthew chapter 6 is a continuation of what we talked about last week. So if you're not familiar with where Matthew is at in your Bible, it is the first book of the New Testament. So the beginning of your Bible, the first 39 books is the Old Testament. Then you're going to find the book of Matthew and the rest of the books of the New Testament. If you're getting kind of familiarized with your Bible and you're not sure where Matthew's at, you can go right to the front of your Bible. There's a table of contents that will show you the page number for Matthew, first book in the New Testament. And what we've been doing over the last couple of weeks, as I already mentioned, we kind of kicked this year off with this idea and this concept that this would be 2022, a year to draw near. How many of you want to draw closer to God this year than you ever have before? So I hope that is your heart and your desire. But with that in mind, James chapter 4 talks about this. He says, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. And so there's this aspect and this element that we need to take some steps in drawing closer in our relationship with God. Last week, or two weeks ago, we talked about the first habit in that, and that's that habit of getting connected with God's family and the support and the encouragement and the prayer and the building up that takes place and the accountability with being a part of God's family. And then last week, we kicked off the first part of this uh, section on prayer. We're going to conclude that today, but last week, we talked about prayer being a huge and a pivotal moment in regards to what, how, and uh, what we can do to grow in our relationship with God. So uh, just to kick this off, there was a story about a father, and uh, as he was walking through his house on the evening, he noticed that his daughter, he had a pretty young daughter, and her door was slightly ajar, and as he walked by, he could see her in the dimly lit room uh, on her knees, and she was praying. She was there, got down by her bed before she went to sleep that night. And so as the father was walking by, he just gradually stopped thinking, oh, this is just a great moment. I get to hear, hopefully, maybe what my daughter is praying. And so as he stood there, he listened attentively, and as she was talking, he couldn't first make it out, and then he realized exactly what she was doing. All of a sudden, he heard her say, Q R. S-T-U-V-W-X-Y-Z. And then she repeated it, A, B, C, D, E, F. And she's just going through the alphabet very slowly. And he's standing there going, what? What on earth? She's way older than to know that she already knows the alphabet. So finally, after about the fourth or fifth time, he opens the door and he says, honey, what are you doing? To her surprise, she turns around, she looks at her dad, dad. I'm praying. He says, well, sweetie, I, I lo it looks like you're praying, but all I hear you doing is you're repeating the letters of the alphabet. You know you're doing that, right? And she goes, yeah, Dad, tonight I really didn't know what to pray, so I just told God, gave him all the letters and thought he'd put it all together the way that he saw fit, right? <laughs> Here's the thing. This morning I jumped onto Google where all facts are found, you know, and I just want to let you know that I typed in prayer in the Google search engine. 925 million hits that I could click on to find out a little bit more about prayer. Here's what's fascinating to me. I typed in how to pray. 1.2 billion hits on Google that I could click on. We are in a culture and in a day and age where people are asking themselves, how on earth do I really pray, and how do I do that effectively? And it's fascinating to think about something. The disciples who were with Jesus for three, roughly three, three and a half years of his life, his earthly ministry, asked Jesus, they could have asked him anything, but in the recorded scriptures, we don't have them coming up to Jesus and saying, Jesus, would you please teach us how you teach? Because you teach like nobody else, which we clearly see in the Bible. He taught as one who had authority. People were amazed at his teachings, but the disciples never asked him that. They never came up according to the scriptures that we see and say, Jesus, teach us how to cast out demons. Just you do it. They never came up to him and said, Jesus, teach us how to do the miracles that you do. But you know what we do find in Luke chapter 11? His disciples come to him and they say, Jesus, teach us how to pray. There's something different about how Jesus prayed and the connection that he had with the Father that the disciples were like, we want to know and we want to have Jesus, what you have. And I've got great news for you this morning. If you would like to know, how many of you would like to know how to pray? 
And I'm going to tell you something. I've got something far better than Google to help you out with that. I've got Jesus' own words in Matthew chapter 6 that we're going to look at this morning. So if you've got your Bibles, Matthew chapter 6, we're going to start at verse 9 today. We talked about verses 5 through 8 last time and navigating through Jesus' specific instructions on how not to pray. This morning, we're going to really dialogue through five incredibly powerful components of how to have an effective communication and prayer life with God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, and here it is. This then is how you should pray, Jesus said. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Father, as we just embark on this time that we will never have in history again, I pray that in a way that only you can, that you would speak to us, that you would bypass me, but that your word would come to life to each and every one of us, and that, Jesus, we would hear your words of how to connect, of how to pray well, and that we would take these truths to heart, and it would not just be information that we know in our head, but it would be lifestyle transformation that our prayer lives would demonstrate the things that we talk about today and that we would draw closer to you through prayer. So, Lord, we've come to meet with you. We ask that you would speak to us clearly and speak to us in a way that we walk out of this place knowing that we have met with the almighty king of all kings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So if you've got your notes, I want to encourage you, you can pull those out at this time. We're going to navigate through this concept and this idea of how to pray effectively. And the first couple of things that I want to point out first is this. Jesus gave this as a model of how to pray. Let me just say that one more time. Jesus gave this as a model for how to pray. Look at what he says in verse 9. This then is how you should pray. I want to be very clear about that because that's very different than maybe what some of us grew up hearing Maybe we have been told that this is what you ought to pray every time that you pray. I know some traditions and some backgrounds say that's what you pray. You pray the Lord's Prayer or maybe as some of us know it as the Disciples' Prayer, what Jesus taught his disciples to pray. But that is not what he said. He wasn't giving us just a ritual to walk through. He's giving us some components here to say, this is how you should pray. This is a model for your prayers. Now, let me be clear. I'm not suggesting to you that us praying the exact words found in the Lord's Prayer is wrong. But if we get to a place, much like Jesus talked about last week, and you can read it for yourselves there in verses 5 through 8, that when we get to a place where all we're doing is repeating phrases over and over and we have no heart behind that, we've missed the point of prayer. So let us be clear. Jesus gives this as a model prayer, not something that we're just supposed to recite every time we pray. The second thing that I want to really point out is this. Effective prayer begins with having a personal relationship. I want to say that again because this is a pivotal part. Effective prayer begins with having a personal relationship. Jesus begins this by saying, our Father in heaven. And I just want to be really clear on this because this is where the foundation of effective prayer starts. It starts with you and I knowing with confidence that I can call God my Father in heaven. He is my heavenly Father, and I am a child of His. Now, I say this because I've been in funeral services. I've heard people talk, and you might even have said this, or maybe you've heard this before, that we are all God's children. I've heard that, and I hear that a lot. And I'm just going to be upfront with you. The Bible never clearly communicates that at all. We are not all God's children. As a matter of fact, the Bible clearly demonstrates and communicates that being a child of God is reserved for those who take a specific step in their life. And that step is putting their faith in Jesus Christ, that he went to the cross, that he paid for our sins, that on the third day that he rose from the dead, and that he did what we deserved. He took on what we deserved and the consequences of our sin. But he paid the price in full. And in that moment that I believe that Jesus Christ did that as my Savior, that he did it to forgive my sins, I step from death 
to life. I step from being not a child of God to be an adopted son and daughter of the king of all kings. And my heartbeat is that for each and every one of us in this room, my heartbeat is for those of you who are watching online, that you are able to confidently say, I have put my faith in Jesus Christ today, and I know with absolute assurance that I am a child of God because it starts at the foundational level with a personal relationship with a God who loves you more than you and I will ever understand. It's got to be the first things first. Is that clear? We good on that? All right. And if you've never taken that step, we would love to chat with you more about that. Even at the end of this service today, we will give you an opportunity that at the end of this, you, you might be saying, man, my prayer life is terrible. I don't even know how to talk with God. I don't even know how to address God. And that maybe walking out of here today for the very first time in your life, you'll be able to say, I now understand I can call him my father in heaven. So I want to give you five key components of an effective prayer life. Number one is this, praise. Would you say that with me? Praise. praise. Actually, let's try that all together one more time. Praise. There we go. This is the first component of prayer that Jesus talks about. And what is praise? Praise is expressing my worship to God. It is giving God my praise and my worship, declaring who he is. This is what Jesus said. This is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. And then he says this word, hallowed be your name. What does that word hallowed mean? Most of us don't use that kind of terminology. It really means and has this concept and this idea of to make holy, to, that something is holy. And what is that word holy? It is to be set apart. It is altogether different. Now the reference here to, G, to Jesus saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Name back then meant far more than it does to us today. When you mention somebody's name, their name signified not just their title, but it signified their character. It signified who they were. And what Jesus is declaring is when we come into the presence of God, we need to realize for a moment who it is that we are addressing. We're not just coming into the presence of somebody that we just get to demand a bunch of stuff from. We are coming into the presence of the almighty king of kings, the one who is hallowed, who is holy, who is altogether different, who is set apart. This last week, uh, our study, we're going through the book of James. And just to give you this idea of hallowedness or holiness... I was reading through in James chapter 1, verse 13, and it's a passage that probably some of us are familiar with. Years ago, I've memorized this passage. I, I know it pretty well, but somehow it just dawned on me in a new way this week. It says this, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, and which is great. God does not tempt us to do evil, but this is the words that James uses, because God is not tempted by evil. Just pause for a moment and think about that. God has never been tempted to do the wrong thing, ever. Even in the moments where he's like, Brian, you are really bugging me right now. I, I just want to unleash some anger and some fury. God is never tempted to do that which is wrong. Why? Because he is perfect. He is holy. He is light. In him there is no darkness at all. That is who we are addressing here. So when we talk about worship, what does that look like? What are some components? The first component is this. Adoration. Adoration. It is praising God for who he is. Giving God praise and adoration for just who he is by his nature. Now, I know for some of us here today, we get to these spots, and this is why it's so important, why I think, and we're going to see in just a moment, why Jesus starts with praising God and understanding whose presence that we are coming into is so pivotal for the rest of our prayer life. He says, you got to start with understanding who it is that you are addressing. And can I ask you a question? When you pray... Who do you think you're talking to? Let me give you some characteristics, some attributes of the God that we serve, and you tell me if it's worth us coming into his presence with praise and thanksgiving. Because for most of us, when we think of praise, we think of a group of people standing on the stage like Jaden and Ryan and Corliss were doing. We're singing some songs, and we're, we're, we're playing an instrument. That is, not, that is a form of praise, but that's not the only praise that there is. Just giving God praise for who he is verbally and declaring that to him is adoration. Let me share with you the God that you serve today if you proclaim that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. He is faithful. He is forgiving. He is a fortress. He's the master and he's a shelter from the storm. He's the commander. He's the creator of heaven and earth. 
He's the defender of widows. He's eternal. He's king. He's God Almighty. He's God my maker. He's the rock. He's my savior. He's great and he is awesome. He is all-powerful and he is all-knowing. He's our comforter, our helper. He is able to do more than we can ask or ever imagine. He is holy. He is the righteous judge. He is the Lord most high, the maker of all. He is love. He's my advocate, my shield, my hope, my hiding place, and the one to be feared. He is the great shepherd. He is compassionate, and he is gracious. He's a consuming fire. He's everlasting. He's the beginning, and he is the end. He is the author of life. He's the savior. He's the great physician. He's the ruler of all, and if you are a child of the king, he is coming one day to return to take you home to be with him forevermore. That's who we serve. And that's who you're talking to. And too many of us are like, Jesus is not your buddy. He's not the guy in the sky. He is the king, the creator of the heavens and earth. He is holy and greatly to be feared and to be praised. Now, for some of us in here, I know we struggle with that. I grew up in a home environment, and this isn't a critique against my parents. We just weren't very uh, verbally expressive and stuff like that. We didn't say things. It wasn't like, man, you're awesome, or hey, kid, this is great, or I didn't do that with my parents. They didn't do that with me. So I remember when I came to this conclusion of praise needs to be part of my prayer life, it was very difficult for me. I remember the very first time I was trying to do this, struggling with it. I was going through the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, which is all about creation. And I remember sitting there going, God, you are the creator of everything. You did a great job at creating stuff. I didn't know what I was doing, right? I'm just being real with you guys because some of these things that we're going to talk about, you're going to look at and go, that's not part of my prayer life. And I want to encourage you. You want an effective prayer life? Have all five components here that we're going to talk about today praising God and giving God the adoration that he alone is deserving of. The second thing out of that in praising him is not just adoration, but thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Praising God for what he has done. So we praise God for who he is, and then we praise God for what he's done in our lives. I know for some of us, we probably struggle with being down and depressed and discouraged. We lack joy in our lives. You want to know one great cure for that? Thankfulness and gratitude. Instead of focusing on what we don't have, to give God thanks and praise for what we have been given. Man, God, you've given me a, a job that provides for my bill. It's not the greatest job in the world, but it provides, it takes care of it. You've given me a spouse that, that loves me and tolerates me. You've given me kids. Maybe you've given me great parents. Maybe my parents aren't the greatest, but God, you've given me parents that are doing their best. What, whatever it may be, to stop and to reflect and to give God thanks. So how do we praise God in our prayer life? Maybe just let me give you a couple of quick examples. Number one, spend time getting to know him through his word. When we spend time reading this, and maybe you'll see a characteristic of who God, he's faithful. You circle that. Man, God, you have been faithful in my life. This is how you've done that. You are a promise-keeping God. You are all-powerful. You are the creator. And you go through this process. You are the savior of my soul. You are the giver of life. You have made me. And just to give him praise for who he is. I'd encourage you maybe even walking through the book of Psalms. And navigating through many of those written by a man by the name of David who gives high praise and accolades to God that maybe through that process, hey, the Lord is my shepherd. God, you've been a shepherd to me. You've guided me behind by streams of water. You, you've taken care of my needs, whatever it may be. And, and then maybe even making a list or just giving time to reflect. God, how have you showed up in my life? What are the things that you've done for me? And to just give him thanks for a change. Because I'm going to be honest, for most of us, prayer becomes this easy avenue to rush in and say, give me, give me, give me, Lord, help me, help them, versus do I really recognize whose presence I'm coming into and who I'm talking with here? It's the God of the universe, and he deserves, do you agree, our praise? I hope that you do. I hope that you do. It's funny, this last week, and, and this is going to set the tone for the rest of our components here. Um, but this last week, I was reading an article on nuclear fusion. Anybody know anything about that? Okay, maybe three of you. I don't know. So I don't know much. You're probably going to tell me afterwards that I don't know what I'm talking about. But I was reading this article that scientists are trying to make this happen and that they actually did it in nuclear fusion of creating this renewable, just incredible energy source. And the problem is that they can't make it happen for very long. It's like a minute or two minutes. I can't remember the exact time. And then they can't do it any longer. And so they're trying all this stuff. And I started to think about this for just a moment. 
These guys are trying so hard. They've been working on it for years. They said, oh, yeah, we might get this thing settled in 2050 or I don't know what it was, some crazy time. And I started to think for just a brief moment. Many of you know, you took your science class back in whatever, junior high school, that we have a sun in our solar system. And that sun is roughly 93 million miles away from the earth. Most of you probably know that. And you realize that at the speed of light, 186,000 feet per second, that the sun could go out and it would take eight minutes before you and I even knew about that. That's pretty incredible, right? But uh, That is pretty incredible, yes? Anybody? Help me out here. You guys don't like science, I guess. Whatever. Lord help them. They don't know what they're doing. So, uh, but did you know this? That the sun at its outer uh, temperature, 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. 10,000 degrees. You thought Roseville was hot, right? I mean, 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. At the core of the sun, scientists estimate, 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. 27 million and you know what's fascinating to me? Scientists are trying to reproduce that. And you know what our God did? He said, you want a son? Let there be a son. And that's all that he had to do. Can you believe that? And the Bible says very clearly that the Lord measures the universe with the expanse of his hand. Can I just tell you something? We think when we've got this all massive star blowing up in our solar system, it's nothing compared to the multitudes of stars that are multitudes times bigger, burning so much brighter. And the God that we serve just said, oh yeah, let there be those things and I'll name them all. I got a name for each and every one of them because I'm the creator of everything. Can you, do you guys get this? Help me understand that you guys are getting what I'm putting down right now because he's worthy of our worship and our praise. You guys are killing me this morning. Number two, <laughs> praise. Starts with number one. Number two is purpose. It's praising for purpose, praying for purpose. It's committing to God's will above my own. And this is why this is so important that we start with this aspect and this element of prayer because he says this, your kingdom come, God, your will be done. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. It's this element of realization that God is far smarter, far superior. His ways are much higher. His thoughts are much higher than yours and for mine. And it starts with this attitude of surrender and yielding to the will of God to say, Lord, I want your purpose above my own because your purpose is so much better. Matter of fact, one Christian author said it this way, prayer is surrender. It's surrender to the will of God in cooperation with that will. If I throw out a boat hook from a boat and I catch hold of the shore and pull, do I pull the shore to me or am I pulling myself to the shore? Prayer is not pulling God to my will, but it's the aligning of my will to the will of God. The greatest example of this throughout Scripture that I can think of is from Jesus himself. When at the end of his life, he has taken his companions and he goes to what we call the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying there to his father. And his prayer is something like this. If there's any way that this cup can be removed from me, please let it be. But not my will, but yours be done. Amen. And Jesus got to this place where he I know we think that Jesus went hopping and skipping to the cross. That's not how he went. He went being obedient to the Father's will, but knowing what it was going to be, how much it was going to cost, the suffering, the pain, not just physical, but even spiritual, when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he didn't want to do that in his humanity, but his purpose, he aligned it with the Father's purpose to say, I want what you want because you know what is best. And that's why it's so important when we come to the Lord to ask, Lord, what is it that your will is? What is your purpose here above even my own? The first two things that we talk about all focus on God, and that's where prayer begins, not on ourselves, but on the Lord. But then the next three that we're gonna talk about then starts to hit us. The third thing is to pray provision. Would you say that with me? Provision? Provision. It's asking God to meet my needs and the needs of others. Give us today our daily bread. And you probably know that back in that culture and time, they didn't have refrigeration like we do. There wasn't this storehouse most of the time for most of these individuals. They were a dependency upon the Lord. But did you catch what it says? It doesn't say, give me my bread. What does it say? Give 
us. And if you look through the Lord's Prayer, it's not all about me. Tap somebody right now and say, it's not all about you. Just tell them that. It's not about you. It says, give us, forgive us, lead us, deliver us. Our Father, do you catch this? It's the, that's the importance and the value of church community, of being together with people, that you're praying not just for yourself, but for the needs of other people around you, that you're praying for your spouse, that you're praying for your kids, that you're praying for the church. Pray for us as the pastoral staff and those who are leading. And pray for each individual. We talked about this being, you know, going through the, the season of sicknesses around in our community right now. Just praying for those things and praying for people and lifting them up. Jim Simbola, he's a pastor now of the Brooklyn Tabernacle, but when he starts, he wrote a book years ago called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. And in that book, he, de he just describes his moment that he was pastoring two churches for a season. Both of them were greatly struggling, having a difficult time. And he said, as a matter of fact, that one of the churches that he was at, the most exciting thing that ever happened in church was they had a pew, and in the front row, the pew broke, and an old woman fell out and landed on the floor. That's how bad church environment was. He's like, that was the most exciting God-spirit-led moment that we had at our church service. And one day he couldn't take it anymore. And he prays a prayer to the Lord. I don't know exactly what his words were, but God, I, I am at my wit's end. I can't do this any longer. And I'm going to make a commitment that I'm just going to make a ministry of prayer. And this tiny little church that had a handful of people in it began to grow and grow and grow. And I don't know the exact numbers of the church now, but there are thousands upon thousands of people that have gone through and been a part of the Brooklyn Tabernacle. Lives have been transformed and changed. And Jim makes this comment. He says, my belief is that God cannot resist those who humbly and honestly admit how desperately they need him. And I think it's true. Someone once communicated to me years ago that prayerlessness is our declaration of independence from God. And I think that that's true. That the things we don't pray about, we're like, I got it. I'll take care of it. I can handle this. And the things that we give to God, he says, oh, watch, watch what I'll do. There's an old story about a mother and a son who walked into a pharmacy. This was many, many years ago. And as they were navigating through the store, they got to the counter, and back then they had a big jar with lollipops and all other kinds of wrapped candy in it. And the pharmacist saw the young boy and he said, hey, young man, would you like some candy? And the little boy with big eyes, yeah, I'd love some candy. The pharmacist said, yeah, go ahead, take a handful. The little boy just kind of sat there. The pharmacist, didn't you hear me? I said, go ahead, take a handful. The boy just kind of sat there some more. Finally, the pharmacist reached in with his hand, and he grabbed a bunch of candy, and the boy with two big hands held out, and he drops all this candy, and he's shoving it all in his pockets. And as they're walking out, the mom is just really confused because she knows her son's not like really a shy kid, especially when it comes to candy. I mean, she's shocked that his hand didn't go right in there. So as they're way out, on their way out the store, she says, Honey, I, I can't believe that you didn't just, why didn't you just reach in there and grab the candy? The little boy looked at his mom and says, Mom, did you see the size of his hands? <laughs> and I think you see the point of what I'm trying to make here. When we try to handle things on our own, we get what we can do. When we give it to the Lord, we get what only he can do. And that's a pretty powerful thing. So what are the things that I should be praying about? All of them. Would you say that with me? All of them. What needs should I be praying about? All of them. Paul says this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in what? Every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. I want to encourage you. There is nothing too small that God doesn't want you to talk to him about, that you can navigate through, that you can spend some time praying about. Pray for each and every need. I love what one mom, she began her prayer in the morning. She said, Lord, so far today, I'm doing all right. I have not gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or self-indulgent. I have not whined or cursed. However, I am going to get out of bed in a few minutes, and I will need a lot more help after that. So... <clears throat> 
The point that I'm trying to make, pray about everything. And just a real quick thing, these aren't in your notes, but this is something that I heard years ago and I read that really impacted me because I think sometimes we get to these places of, well, I pray about stuff and God doesn't answer. Oh, God answers every request. He may just not answer it in the way that you want him to answer that. So let me give you four ways that I have discovered that God answers my prayers and probably yours as well. The first one is no, right? It's, that's true. It's an answer. Uh, there are certain things my k- kids come and ask me for. Hey, can we have $1,000? No. Uh, I mean, that's not going to happen, right? Uh, there's certain things that if I ask God, Lord, can I have a new Lamborghini? He's going to say, no, I'm not going to bless you with that right now just because it's wrong. The request is wrong. But then there are other things that the request is right, but the truth of the matter is maybe the timing's not right. And in that moment, God says, Slow. The request is good, but this isn't the right time. There's some other things that need to start to take place. Maybe some circumstances around us need to transpire. And so we're just going to slow it down, keep praying about that, and in some time, I will answer that request with a yes. There's other things that maybe it's not the circumstances that aren't right or the request. Those are right, but the truth of the matter is maybe I'm not right, and that's grow. Brian, you need to grow some more before I give you that. Maybe for you, that's a job. Maybe for you, that's a ministry that you're passionate about. Maybe it's uh, some circumstances in your life that you're really striving for, but God says, you know what? You're just not quite ready maturity-wise or, or you know, in the capability of some skills. I just got to grow you a little bit more before I answer that request with a yes. So you got no, slow, grow, and go. And that's when the request is right, the circumstances are right, I'm right, and God says, yeah, let's do this thing. And just to be aware that God is always answering our prayers. Number four is pardon. Pardon. It's this idea that seeking God's forgiveness and extending forgiveness to others. And I want to encourage you that for for many of us, we probably read through this, and for some of us, this is the most difficult out of the group, but it's something that's extremely important to the Lord and to obviously to Jesus, to teach on it. He says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. This idea of getting honest with God about circumstances in our life. John Bunyan said this. He said, prayer will make a man cease from sin or sin will entice a man to cease from prayer. And I think that's true. When we're living in a lifestyle that's in opposition to God, Most of us don't want to pray, spend time talking with him. And then John Flavel said this, they that know God will be humble, and they that know themselves cannot be proud. Can I just ask you a personal question because Jesus talked about it? When was the last time you just got really candid and honest with God? And I'm not talking about of stuff you want, but about your personal life of where you're at. And maybe where you're at, in living for him? I mean, when's the last time you just honestly said, God, I I struggle with lust and I want this out of my life. I ask you to forgive me of it. I've been lying about some things to my friends, to relationships, to people I care about. I don't want to do that anymore. And God, would you forgive me of that? The way I've been talking about people, I've been stealing from my workplace. I mean, we can go down a million and one things. But when's the last time you've gotten really honest with God about what's going on in your life? Because I'm just going to let you in on a little secret. The God who created the heavens and the earth, you're not hiding anything from him. When we get honest with God, we're not telling him anything that he doesn't already know about. But what we are doing is being humble enough to say, God, I, I know that this is having an impact on my communion, my relationship with you, and I don't want that to be there anymore. And I want you to forgive me of that. It's part of prayer. And it's part of what makes us humble when we can recognize that we're not all that in a bag of chips. You're not all that. That we've got faults. We've got failings. And God knows about those. And that we would just be honest with him about it. And genuinely seek his forgiveness. Because the second part is that we're extending that forgiveness to others too. Which for some of us that might be challenging. I don't know if I've ever read it quite this way, but if you read what Jesus said, forgive us our debts as we forgive those, 
that as we have forgiven our debtors. That could be a scary thing for some of us in this room if that's really the case, right? Jesus, forgive me like I've forgiven my family members. Oh, 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 that's not good. Or my ex-spouse or my kids or my parents or the former friends. Because here's the truth. When we get to the place where we can get honest before God and realize I don't deserve his forgiveness and he has freely given it to me. Other people don't deserve my forgiveness, but I want to freely give to them what the Lord has given to me too. It's an important component. Pardon. And the last one, and I'll close with this, is protection. Praying for protection from the Lord. Seeking God's help in temptations and trials. In verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Samuel Chadwick said this, the one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, and prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil. He mocks our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. And I like that. And that moment that we would ask God, guard my steps in the areas that we know, hey, I have some temptation in my life. God, prevent me from going down that road and that avenue. There's an old story of a man who was trying to lose weight. He made a New Year's commitment. He had been doing pretty good for about the first month. And, and as he was, uh, he had made a commitment that he was going to stay away from all the donut shops in his areas. He found a route to his workplace that would keep him away from all the donut shops. And on one particular morning, he had a craving, and then he was praying about it. God, lead me not into temptation. I want to stay strong. But he walks into his workplace, and he's got three dozen uh, donuts in three boxes there. And his co-workers are like, hey, we heard that you were on this. What happened? You've been doing so good. And he says, I got to be honest with you guys. These are the Lord's donuts today. And they're like, the Lord's donuts? How do, you, how do you figure that? He says, well, the reality is I was praying that the Lord would not lead me to temptation. And I was driving by the donut shop that I said that I wouldn't. And I said to God, if you really don't want me to have any donuts, if you, if you do want me to have some donuts, open up a spot right in front of the donut shop right there. And he said, and it was an amazing thing on the eighth time around the block. <laughs> Somebody once said it this way, right? When you leave a temptation, don't leave a forwarding address. I really do like that. But are we praying, not just for ourselves, but spouses? Are you praying for your spouse that God would guard the hearts of your husband or your wife, your spouse, your mate, to steer them away from temptation and make them strong in the midst of it? Parents, parents, can I plead with you? You got to be praying for your kids. If you don't know, I mean, just, I know I don't have to tell you, tune in to our TV and to our, the internet and all that. Actually, don't tune in. That would be a better move. But the things that our children are bombarded with and the next generation, for those of you with young kids, man, you got to be praying for your kids even now that they would be built up and strengthened, that they would be empowered with the armor of the living God in Ephesians chapter 6 to withhold and to stand firm. Children, praying for your parents, praying for this church, that we would pray that God would guard us from temptation and give us the strength to go through it. I close with James chapter 5. It's a verse that is pretty significant to me and probably not for the reasons that you may think. But I want to read this with you because it says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and it is effective. Now, I know for some of you right now, you're like, well, yeah, like, like Jesus, pretty powerful and effective when he prayed. The Apostle Paul, I mean, that's pretty powerful. Billy Graham, you know, those were powerful people. But it's the second part of this that I actually find just great um, comfort in. It says this, Elijah was a human being. Catch the second part of this. Even as you and I are. He's just a man. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. And then James continues the rest of Elijah's story that you can read in the book of Kings. But my point is, you don't have to be this elitist to have an effective prayer life. Jesus taught us how to do it. And my encouragement to you today is you can have a powerful and effective prayer life. Just do it. Can I encourage you with that? Just do it. 
just spend time with God. We have the privilege that we can tune into the Lord and talk with him anytime we want to. And we talk to that he is the creator of the heavens and the earth, that above speaking to your spouse, above speaking to your boss, you have the privilege of speaking with the God of all creation each and every day. Amen. Just do it. And I'd encourage you, take five minutes, ten minutes out of your day to carve out, put it in your schedule and say, God, this is my time with you and with you alone. And would you commit to saying, hey, and I realize maybe there's a component or two in there that you go, this is a little bit underdeveloped in my life. Make that the priority this week to say, I'm going to work on that. Maybe I'm going to work on praising God. I'm going to work on praying for God's purpose in my life. I'm going to start praying for provisions. I'm not just myself, but for other people, for pardoning. I, if I can extend forgiveness or seek God's forgiveness and be real with him, I'm going to pray for protection. And make that a guide for your prayer life. And watch what he'll begin to do. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Father, we thank you for just the privilege of prayer, this habit that we can develop that at any moment of the day that we get the opportunity to not just talk to an individual, but the one who has existed before even time, before earth was here, before mankind was even created, before there was even light, you have always been, you are eternal. And you invite us to have a conversation with you. That's a, just incredibly humbling and Father, I would just pray even for myself that you would forgive me for not taking more opportunity and realizing the privilege that that is. But Lord, for each and every one of us as individuals and as a church, that you would help us to become a praying church because we're praying individuals. And that God, we would give you the praise that you are deserving of. That we would seek your forgiveness and extend it. That we would always desire your purpose above our own, but yet at the same token that we can present our requests to you and that you hear them. And God, that you would protect us as we navigate this life to live a life that is sold out for you individually and corporately. So Lord, this week as I pray that you would move and speak into our lives, that we would take steps to develop this habit more. And God, that those times would be fruitful, they would be powerful, and that they would be effective. And maybe you're here right now, and quite honestly, you have to go back to the very first, first start of this message of talking about having a relationship that you could claim that God is your Father. And you don't know if you could do that today, but you want to walk out of here knowing that you have the confidence that you've put your faith in Jesus, that you've invited Him into your life, that you are forgiven, that you today are a child of God, and that He listens to His sons and to His daughters. And if that's you right now, whether you're watching online or whether you're here in service with us, and you say, today's the day I want to receive what Jesus has done for me, could I encourage you maybe to say a simple prayer like this in your heart to, to just jumpstart that relationship? God, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die for my sins. Today I believe that. That my consequences were paid on the cross. And so Jesus, right now, I invite you into my life to give me a brand new start, to forgive me. And God, I thank you for, for making me one of your kids today. Thank you for this relationship with you that I don't deserve, but that you've freely given. And thank you for the privilege of prayer. In Jesus' name we pray.